Hello, this is Reforest Now. We are a not-for-profit operated primarily in the Daintree and Byron Bay. We are working to protect and expand rainforest ecosystems by engaging in growing and planting rainforest trees, surveys, scientific studies and reports, education and considerable volunteer engagement. We work with government, departments, NGOs, businesses and individuals to reach these outcomes. This particular presentation is singular focused. We will produce a superficial brief of known, endangered, critically endangered or extinct species of the Daintree area of far north Queensland. But first, I'd like to show you some footage of a familiar face. Where of the places you've been to, where have been the places that have surprised you most and where have been places where, not, not disappointed as such, but maybe not as thrilling? Uh, I don't know. Uh... One of the places that, that uh, is, really, is really extraordinary uh, is the north of Queensland. And that's in Australia? In Australia. It's full of great things. Uh, and one tends to think that, I don't know, that, that the Amazon is a great place for jungles. But the northern Queensland jungle is absolutely fantastic. And very few people go there. Um, and uh, they've got the Great Barrier Reef when it gets too hot, and the other coral reefs, just great to swim on. And so no, uh, and they're wonderful birds and extraordinary animals that you've never, th never thought of. I mean, amazing things and wonderful yeah. power birds that are extraordinary. Wow. No, great place. Now, I'd like to give recognition to the photographers whose work is present in this presentation of endangered species in the Daintree. We have attempted to contact all of you. However, some images online were not attributed to an author. Other email addresses no longer worked, and several contact emails were locked behind site registrations. Please contact us if your work is present here and not attributed to you, so that your image can be either correctly attributed or blocked out. Please note that this production is entirely gratis by our team and is being made as an educational piece to bring the reality of endangered Daintree species to the foreground, as lists are not nearly as compelling or able to hold one's attention as we would like. Here's the portrait view for species. Common names in the top left, and below that, using colour, we will break up binomial, in that instance two named, Latin names for species in colour-coded segments. Below that will be a general group to remind you of where we're at, so th that'll just say birds or amphibians or mammals, it's non-scientific. Below that, will be the taxonomic, the class, order and family of the species in the portrait window. And then we're mostly going to be relying on the Nature Conservation Act status of a species, which is abbreviated as NCA. And these will be colour coded uh, from vulnerable, where we're not, we're not covering vulnerable species as such. However, you'll see that we're using more than one classification system and in some instances a species will be vulnerable under one system and endangered under another. So vulnerable is purple, and then endangered yellow, and then obviously critically endangered red to signify that it's the most significant situation. So the NCA status will appear up here in the portrait window. Next, we will have the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act status. That'll be abbreviated to EPBC, and it'll use the same colour scheme. And that'll be right next to the NCA status. Thirdly, we will give you an indication of the endemicity of the species, where it lives. Now, we had to generalise this to some extent because there are differences between data sets, particularly for endemicity. So what we're saying is, Queensland only, uh, being obviously the smallest, so the most concerning, the red, QA meaning Queensland and Australia, or the most widely distributed, QAI, Queensland Australia International. And that will appear third. And the next thing you'll see on the portrait slides is photo credits, and these will appear in the far bottom right for any images used. Let's begin. The Australian lace lid is the first of the Litorias. Litoria, by the creek, Dei is a name. The order, an without, tail. The family, Hylidae. There's two translations of this. 
The one I'm using is from Hylas, the Greek friend of Hercules who was abducted by the water nymphs. These are a rainforest specific species and their eggs are laid in a cohesive clump under rocks in rapidly flowing water. After hatching, they'll aggregate under the rock until their digestive systems have formed. The armoured mist frog, also by the creek, armoured. Laurium uh, is a uh, Roman cuirass, an arm, a body armour. These occurred over 120 square kilometres, but they're now limited to just four kilometres of stream in the Daintree lowlands. The waterfall frog, also a Littoria, tiny ears, is larger than the other Littorias here, and its most stable populations are found once again in Cape Tribulation Daintree. The mountain mist frog, Littoria nicolensis, this is just a name, uh, used to be found across two thirds of the wet tropics region, between about 400 metres in altitude to about a kilometre. It's rarely been seen in the last 25 years. The common mist frog, Littoria by the creek, fast flowing water, st uh, sticking. So sticking its eggs in fast flowing water, that's what it means. Within a range from sea level to, a, to just over a kilometre in altitude, it has apparently disappeared from most of the upland sites that are south of the Daintree River. Now the northern tinker frog, its name means tau is T-shaped feet or toes or fingers, dactylus, fast flowing water, lover. And its name tinker frog comes from the tapping sound of its call which is repeated four or five times. And it was restricted to four mountaintops from Thornton's Peak in Cape Trib, Cape Tribulation, to Mount Ballenden Kerr between uh, very high altitudes of 950 to one and a half thousand meters. And it has suffered a massive range contraction thought to be lost as recently as 1991. And after not being seen for quite a time, five individuals were heard calling in a high altitude tributary of the Mulgrave River, and then seven more were heard in the Mitchell River at Mount Carbine. Most members of the Tau Dactylus genus have suffered serious declines, and obviously the prime candidate is, is um, Chai tridiomycosis, which is a fungal infection that's, that's been killing this family. And its family means mussel frog, patrokos in Greek. The next is an extinct species, the sharp-snouted day frog. Its name, again, T-shaped toes, if you look at its back feet. Pointed nose. Now there's only three individuals that have been seen since the mid 90s and it's considered extinct. It was first in this species that uh, Batrico chytridium dendrobatidis was identified. That's what causes chytridiomycosis. And its family, the Myobatrachidae, uh, arose about 100 million years ago when dinosaurs were dominating the planet. And they're unique amongst amphibians because they care for their young. And its genus Taudactylus contains just six species, and the whole genus is considered to be highly threatened with extinction, as most of them have become extinct or are highly endangered. Now they're normally found amongst rocks and leaf litter, along the edges of fast-flowing rainforest streams, as you've noticed with many. Now if there's any further specimens of these found, they're very likely to be collected to attempt to save the species in captivity. The beautiful nursery frog, I could not uh, translate its, the, the first part of its name, but the second part would mean uh, well jointed or put together. Its family, small hylid. Now it's found only in the Daintree National Park and perhaps only now on Thornton's Peak. And unlike typical frogs, the beautiful nursery frog breeds on land and their eggs do not hatch into tadpoles. One clutch was found with 17 eggs under a rock being guarded by a male in some kind of primitive parental care. Now the micro hylids have made North Queensland the home for a very long time and the origin of their species goes back many, many millions of years, much like the Taudactylids. They persisted during the rapid rainforest contraction of the late Pleistocene, which arguably occurred in the vicinity of 100,000 years ago. 
and the total distribution of the beautiful nursery frogs is thought to be only 7 square kilometres now. Moving on to birds. The great knot, calidrus meaning uh, a grey shorebird, slender beaked. Its class Aves refers to the flyers, to the birds. The Charadri order is just referring to an early individual uh, species found of this order, which meant uh, lives in a ravine, Charadris. And the family is um, from Scopolax, which is a Latin, a Latin word for a wood bird. The great knot is a small wader. It's the largest of the calidrids. The females are a bit bigger than the males, and they have uh, very different uh, breeding and non-breeding plumages and juvenile plumages. It's been recorded all around the Australian coast, with a few of them adventuring inland, but it's now becoming absent at several of its regular sites. The Curlew Sandpiper, also grey shorebird, but its species name means rusty looking, which is exactly how it looks. Now the sexes are similar, but the females have a slightly larger and longer bill. Now the red knot, again, you'll, this name is interesting, grey shorebird, dark grey. And it has a worldwide distribution, breeding at a range of locations right around the Arctic. Uh, this is in the far north of Canada, Europe and Russia. Uh, this species will then migrate to non-breeding areas that extend to the southernmost parts of the Americas, Africa, Europe and Australasia. The Eastern Curlew's name, Numenius, means new moon, from Madagascar. It's one of 20 birds that the Australian government has prioritised resource allocation to, and it might just be the largest of the sandpipers. It's about 110, 115 centimetres across its wings, and a long-haul flyer. It takes an annual migratory flight to Russia and northeastern China to breed, arriving back home to Australia in August to feed on crabs and mollusks in the intertidal mudflats. The lesser sand plover, again Charadrius, meaning from the ravine, and Mongolia. They have populations all through mainland Asia, hence the name. Sexes differ when in breeding plumage, but they're inseparable when, in the, when they're not breeding, and juveniles are, however, always distinguishable. They're often quite gregarious and they'll get together in large flocks, and they'll join other waders when they're feeding or roosting, especially greater sand plovers. When they're in New Zealand, they'll flock with double-banded plovers as well. Now this, um, this is not to be mistaken with Lamosa laponica, this is a subspecies. So Lamosa meaning muddy, from Lapland. This is a Linnaean reference to the um, province of Sweden. And the subspecies is Mensberii. It has dodged all the endangered lists with the Daintree. However, when I looked up its GPS coordinates for sightings, it's actually found on the Daintree River which is in between the two parts of the Daintree National Park. Now, the Lamosa Laponica group are polytypic, so there's lots of subspecies of them, which is easy to get these confused. The females are larger with longer bills, and the males have a duller breeding plumage. They nest in the Northern Hemisphere during the boreal summer. Now, the, sun, the, uh, the Southern Giant Petrel, its name means Big Swimmer Giant, and its order means go forth and rise in the air form type. So because of their, because of the, uh, the, the duress they face in their migratory patterns. The southern giant petrel can be up to a metre long and a wingspan of two metres. Uniquely, they produce a stomach oil that's made up of wax esters and triglycerides. These can be sprayed out of their mouths to defend against predators. And they're also an energy rich food source for chicks and for the adults during long flights. They have a salt gland um, above their nasal passage, somewhat reminiscent of a lacrimal gland, which helps to desalinate their bodies due to the high amount of ocean water that they imbibe. This, uh, this is a southern cassowary. This particular one is, um, is Garrus. He's a cassowary that raises his chicks on a property owned by Rainforest Trust Australia at Cape Tribulation. This is where we built a nursery in partnership with Rainforest Trust Australia and we uh, supplied trees from. Garrus lives on site and around the area and uh, this image is taken right in the middle of where our volunteers stay. If you're ever interested in planting trees with us in far north Queensland, uh, you'll see the email address. Now it's one of 20 bird species that the Australian government prioritised 
Obviously, it's a large flightless bird with a striking color. It is one of the few surviving ratites related to emus, ostriches, and kiwis from New Zealand. And estimates of the species age don't seem very stable to me, but 40 to 60 million years old is a pretty good bet. And some resources will say that the species has been around for 80 million years. It's distributed also in Indonesia and New Guinea. Estimates of the numbers left here vary, but most authors will say there's about two and a half to four and a half thousand cassowaries left in Australia. If you look on the head of Garrus here, there's a crack on the front of the cask and it bends slightly towards us. It bends slightly to the right. You can identify cassowaries by this cask that's on their head. It's one of the best ways to tell them apart. The molecular structure of the cask is, is honeycombed to help them sense low vibrating sounds that are made by other cassowaries. And when you hear a cassowary uh, making a territorial call or a sound of irritation, Sometimes the sounds are very low and other times you just feel a vibration in your body because they go below our hearing range. They're very territorial and mostly solitary and uh, you don't want to see a cassowary upset because it can run faster than you. They can do about 40 kilometers per hour. Now they eat fleshy fruits of over 230 odd species. This number seems to be rising with more current research and obviously a lot of the species that they eat the seeds from have very, very big seeds. And it's been said that without the cassowaries, there won't be dispersal for these seeds and we'll be losing hundreds and hundreds of species. So you can call them a keystone in the World Heritage area. Now, they're threatened mostly by wild domestic and pig hunting dogs. And I can personally attest to this having seen photographs of Carbine Road in Cape Tribulation, where three out of only 100 cassowaries that we have in Cape Trib were mauled to death by pig hunting dogs uh, where we, we could see um, some of the effects of the pig hunting dogs left in the area and sightings of the car and whatnot. Now their other threats are car strikes which happens quite a bit down towards Mission Beach and wild pigs are said to compete for food and potentially attack their chicks when they're exposed. And one thing I didn't cover is the name of the order. Thrutheon is from Latin meaning um, ostrich. So ostrich shape. The red goshawk is uh, has a name that describes it quite well. Red, three orbs or testicle but orbs, red three orbs radiating and that is the color of its plumage. Now its order, falconi as in falcon actually means curved. That's referring to the curved beak of predatory birds and uh, form once again meaning shape. So curved shape and the family archipta is from hawk. This is probably the rarest of the Australian birds of prey and it takes a broad range of live prey, mostly other birds. They are solitary and they're very thinly dispersed in Australia and they're usually only seen on their own. Our first mammal is quite extraordinary, the greater large-eared horseshoe bat. Its name in Latin, nose, crest from the Philippines. Its order, hand, wing. Its family, nose crest. This bat has enormous ears and this nose crest, which is sometimes bright yellow, but it's not just the nose, it's also the anus and the penis that can have this color. And it has the lowest of all the rhino, um, rhinolophids when it comes to its echolocation. And that can be down at 28 kilohertz to 34 kilohertz. The, uh, the bare-armed sheath-tailed bat was basically thought to be extinct. Its name, sac, throated, as in for the pouch, again sack-throated, naked, half-moon. And if you look up the sides of its body, it's hairless in half-moons on either side of its flanks. Its family, embolon uri, means the tail, so embolon is poked in, so the, the tail has been poked in, so imagine it's, it looks like the tail has been poked in through the skin afterwards. Now they're incredibly rare and they're only found in North Queensland and they weren't seen for a very long time. Now this image is Zach. He was found at Hartley's Crocodile Park in um, Palm Cove. One of the keepers found him. He was taken to Batreach in Karanda and rehabilitated. Then he was released back at the park. But while he was in care, his sonar frequencies were captured to help find other ones of his species. Since then, they've been found at Hartley's again, but also, believe it or not, at the Cairns Botanical Gardens. Now the spotted tail quoll is a very famous endangered species. Its name means 
hairy, tailed, blotched, or blotted, and slender. And its order means many, first or early, teeth. It's about the same size as a cat, but it's got a longer body and shorter legs. They can grow to about 76 centimeters in length, and a male can be up to seven kilograms. And when they begin to move quickly, they can bound, and they're also incredibly good climbers. They can be very vocal under mating or territorial situations, and what you'll hear is a, is a really distinct piercing scream. And they're usually nocturnal and solitary. Similarly related is the northern quoll. Once again, hairy tail, thumbed. And you'll see it's making good use of, a, a, you could say, an opposable thumb as it eats that insect. Now it's the smallest of the four Australian quolls. It's also nocturnal, preys on invertebrates, but also small mammals, reptiles, birds, carrion, fruit, and it's the most arboreal and the most aggressive of all the Australian quolls. Now during the mating season, which is in the tropical winter, the males expend a lot of energy fighting each other and they don't live to, to see a second year. And females will be denning in tree hollows or logs or rock crevices and they can raise up to eight young. At the end of the breeding season, almost the entire population will be mature females and they're young. And the females might live for two or three years. Now, predation by feral cats has been a major threat to this species. Now, they're especially vulnerable as well to cane toads. And during the last few decades, as cane toads spread across northern and eastern Australia, their populations have deg um, degraded in, um, in, a, in a correlation with the spread of cane toads into their home areas. The betong is a, I believe it's an Aboriginal name, betongia, and then obviously tropical for this variant. Its order means two front or early teeth, and its family is also, I believe, an Aboriginal name. Now it's solitary and nocturnal. It's heavily dependent on truffles in the ground as a food source, as well as subterranean stem bases, which it gets from cockatoo grasses and lilies. Now they are one of the top truffle dispersers, and quite a few truffles seem to be eaten only by the betongs, which means that they're dependent on the betongs for dispersal of their spores. If you lose the disperser, and some of the truffles could then disappear. If we lose the truffles, then some of the trees that are dependent on uh, a symbiotic relationship with the truffles could be lost. Now these trees are um, in some areas where there's poor soil, they're relying on the truffles to fix and make nutrients available in the poor soil. So this could be a, uh, a keystone species of a, of a more covert nature. Now they can reproduce all year round and under good conditions, a female might have three young in a year. And competition with wild introduced pigs are a, uh, are a threat, obviously, to the betongs. Now onto the club mosses. These appear to have evolved just over 400 million years ago. It's almost, it, it, they must have been one of the very first things to colonize land from the plantae, and uh, one of the first to develop vascular systems. The first one, the rock tassel fern, its name means fire, tail, rough to the touch, and its class, wolf foot. And it's a type of fur club moss and one of the oldest living fossils of the fern allies. There's fossils of this going back to the Carboniferous, which is about 360 million years ago. It's found in the wet tropics, in a few places in Victoria, one place in New Zealand, PNG, Indonesia, and the Philippines. It's found growing on trees and rocks, and especially near wet, humid sites, and also on mangrove trees. The second related type, fire tail, thread form, thread shape. And there's not much information I could find on this species. It's considered endangered in Australia, and it's usually only found in high mountain peaks in the uppermost branches of trees. A very specific habitat. Now the third of the, the Phlegmarius here, and you can see it, it hangs in these incredible tassels, is very unusual for a plant in its appearance. And that makes it an epiphyte. It'll grow in trees or rocks, and has been recorded growing in staghorns, as you can see in both of these images. Now it was only known from two collections in Queensland, both in lowland swampy forest um, areas near Cairns, and one of those was cleared for urban development. It's also been said that they're found in coastal swamps in the Daintree Cape Tribulation section and heading north to Cooktown, and also in the McIlwraith Range. Ferns. A first fern, Chingia meaning uh, a Roman girdle, if you look at the right hand image, or the thickness of the, the continuous width of the leaf. So you think of a, a, a Roman waist belt, 
And Australis doesn't mean Australia, it means Southern. And the class, many, footed, as you think of ferns and the way that they, they spread and rhizomes and whatnot. Now the order Aspidia, it should be referring to the shield shape of the fern, or it may also mean broad. The family, Thalys, is a, could be the ancient Greek for female or fertile, and fern. Now it's a small genus with about 20 species in it, found through Melanesia and eastwards to Tahiti. It's the only Australian, Chingia Australi Australis is the only Australian representative of the whole genus, and it's only in North Queensland. It's found in and around Wurundjeri National Park, and obviously also in the Daintree National Park. Uh, and there's very, very few populations found. I believe there's about 12 populations of Chingia Australis and maybe 500 individuals. Next up is uh, a species only, that was only found on Thornton's Peak, which as I've um, stated is right next to where we grow trees with Rainforest Trust Australia in Cape Tribulation. We, we, view, we look up onto Thornton's Peak from our nursery. Its name is Membrane Leaved and an author, and its order the same, membrane, leaved. Now, this was an epiphytic fern growing on another plant, and it was found at about a kilometre in altitude. It's, that's an extremely small habitat. Now these pictures here aren't of Hymenophyllum whiteii, but they're nearby genetic relatives, so give you some idea what it looked like, because I, I can't find an image of it. The next, the grass fern, its name means single, stroke or um, letter, single stroke if you look at the image, gives fruit. And the family, vit from um, vita from life, aria, so life in the air. And it is one of the smallest of all the ferns, densely covered in shiny scales and it was recorded at Mount Ballenden Kerr in North Queensland, but it was very difficult to find confirmation of the species. And it's, it's unknown um, how it went extinct, but it was, uh, it, was also it was also said to be found in the Daintree. This one has a, quite an unusual and morbid name. If you look at the, shape, the triangular shape of the leaf, and what you can't see here is a very long stem leading onto that leaf. And the name is Sandal of the Dead Without Veins. Now if you think of a Greek sandal from an old film that wraps up to the knee with a long cord, long leather strap, that's what they're referring to with the name. It's found um, in the areas around the Daintree River and it was once seen in Cape York. And there's a lot more of them in PNG than Australia, but it could become extirpated here, as in locally extinct. The middle filmy fern is very delicate. Its name means many veined and uh, that's a, a Swedish botanist, I believe. Sorry if I got that wrong. Now, uh, it occurs in, uh, in the northeast Queensland area. It's also seen in Norfolk Island, New Zealand, New Guinea, Fiji, Samoa, and Tahiti. This species name means doubled. As you can see, its growth habit is growing in two, two pairs. Doubled and pale green. Its family, a theory AC, believe it or not, refers to the slow opening of its, of its uh, spores. This is found possibly as far south as Innisfail and up to Cape Tribulation. Now let's look at dicots. I, um, I just want to separate a few of these. So the higher dicots, they tend to have uh, flower parts in multiples of four or five. They, uh, they tend to have net venation. What that means is if you look at the leaf of a dicot, it looks like a bird's feather. It has a big vein up the middle and then it has angular strokes of veins coming out. Now dicots usually have a, a long singular taproot and if you cut the stem and, and inspect it, the vascular tubing will be bundled around the, the outside, i.e. the bark. It'll be bundled around the outside of the stem and there'll be two embryonic leaves in the seed. The first dicot, its name is yellow starman or flower, beautifully formed. Its class, named after Pierre Magnol, the French botanist, and the order means bitter. They have a grey flaky bark and it's only known to occur along only two hectares on Cooper's Creek between Cape Tribulation and the Daintree River. There is unconfirmed reports it's also in Noah's Creek, which wouldn't surprise us from having done expeditions in Noah's Creek. And it's generally found within a few meters of the creek line. So that, that it occurs along about two hectares over maybe one and a half kilometers of creek. The Daintree Gardenia's name is named after the Scottish botanist and then Actinos is a light ray a flower, which is exactly how it looks. Its class, 
is from a time when the, obviously the first of its class was red looking. So red looking and the order red. It's endemic to North Queensland and it's only been found so far in Noah's Creek. It's said that uh, it's one of the sweetest smelling of all of the gardenias. It's one of the many rainforest plants with a simple white flower, so it's probably pollinated by an insect not including butterflies, bees, or birds, or, you know, it's not brightly colored, so it's probably a beetle or something like that. This is a rather stunning find. It's as yet undiscovered or unknown, Amiima, folded like a fan. Its order, uh, it's related to the sandalwoods, and its family means strapped on flower. Surprisingly, this is found at Rocky Creek Dam in northern New South Wales in the former Big Scrub Rainforest. That's where the biggest surviving patch of rainforest is down there. Now there's a possibility it's been seen in the Atherton Tablelands and it is also seen in Daintree National Park. Uh, it's found overseas in Papua, New Caledonia and Vanuatu and it's obviously an ancient species as far spread as New Caledonia and northern New South Wales. It's a bushy mistletoe and it grows as a parasite on rosewood trees in New South Wales. This, uh, this rock violet, uh, its name may mean um, fertile, uh, and that's an author's name I believe. The order, Lamiales, um, this is interesting, it means open mouth. So um, flowers from this order have a pit in the middle, like a sunken middle, and then the flower around it. It's endemic to North Queensland and it's apparently only found in Noah's Creek. Noah obviously refers to Biblical Noah. Once again, Noah's Creek in the Daintree, one of the two major creeks that keeps coming up as a reservoir for ancient surviving species. Noah's Creek tree, named after an author. The family, um, Hamamalida, refers to bearing small fruit. Obviously restricted to Noah's Creek, only found ab amongst about 20 hectares of the forest. And believe it or not, this tree is a tropical cousin of the witch hazels. Now this species was very hard to study, it's inadequately known of as far as I can see. It was thought extinct but was recently rediscovered in the mountains in Mount Emerald, in the Atherton Tablelands and in the Daintree Mountains. Now its name, facing, flowers, white and hairy. The next species means ancient, tree and author and the order means um, broad bean. Obviously, once again, this refers to the original discoveries of the orders. And the family means mimic. It's only known from Cape Tribulation in the Daintree, the northern part, and it lives between sea level to about 200 metres. Now, in the Saturn Ash, Sai meaning together, like sin, Zygium meaning coupled. So obviously the first Sysigiums had coupled leaves and uh, these, these are only known uh, in the Cape Tribulation part of Daintree National Park. And, oh sorry, and Glenham is, is I believe, an author's name. The next species uh, is one of 300 in its genus. Glacidion means arrow pointed, white powdery. And its family means leaf flower. And the, um, look, the Glyocidions are distributed from Madagascar to the Pacific Islands. Their species are often the food plants of the larvae of some of the Lepidoptera. This is obviously an, author, an author's name, Sankolska, and Stipularis, in this instance meaning vegetative growth at the base of the petioles of each leaf. And its order, Euphorbia is named after the Greek physician. These are known only from a few collections made in uh, Devil Creek between Mount Molloy and Mossman at about 400 metres. And there's, it's also been found in the Gelatin area and obviously on the southern part of Daintree National Park. This species means benefits the ear from New Guinea. And the order is Gentianalis, so that means named after King, the, the Illyrian King Gentian, whose people discovered the first of this order. Found from uh, Mount Windsor to Tully, and it grows in a variety of ecosystems, so rainforest sclerophyll, as Elocasia Malaluca woodlands, uh, Malaluca swamp, and grasslands. It's also growing in New Guinea, this species. The orange tamarind, have a look at the fruit before I go to the description. Wall covered winged fruit. It exactly says what it is. And its order is a sapo soap India. Soap from India, so it's a sapindale. So known only from collections from the Mossman and Gelatin areas. Two lower dicots. The Cooper's Creek Walnut, again Cooper's Creek. Ende is difficult to translate, but Andra should be referring to masculinity. And obviously Cooper's Creek in the name. 
its order is from the laurels, from if you think back to the laurels worn by the Romans, meaning victory. It's known only from two populations in areas adjacent to Cooper's Creek, and there's about 34 plants in one and 17 plants in the other. They say it occupies just 30 hectares in total area. This one means fleshy, footed, salare, this is salare, it's a different Latin root. So this means fleshy, footed, and thickly connected. Its order is buttercup, and its family is moon seed. This is a large woody climber. You can find it from Ballenden Kerr to Mission Beach. There's disjunct populations in Noah's Creek, again, and Cooper's Creek, again, in Cape Tribulation Daintree. These are areas where we plant trees, obviously. It is recorded in the Wurunurin uh, National Park as well. Now monocots, before we do these, we're almost at the end now. These tend to have flower parts in multiples of three. They have parallel venation, which means when you look at their leaves, you won't see a big vein straight down the middle. They have adventitious roots that climb about, and their, vascular, uh, their vascularity isn't bunched around the edge of the stem like it is with dicots. So if you cut a monocot stem and look down it, all the tubing that's sending water and nutrients through the plant is evenly distributed through the stem. And of course, they have a single embryonic leaf in their seeds. The first, the mangrove orchid, its name means tree life, wonderful. Its class, from the Roman lilium for lily, and its order, orchid meaning testicle because of the bulb of the plant. It's found around Cairns and the Daintree, in the Solomons and in Papua. This is a medium to gigantic, depending on its opportunity, ep epiphyte, it can get very large. It'll grow in coastal lowland forests and swamps, or it can be a lithophyte on exposed rock. The blue orchid has no significance in its name other than tree life, and then an author's name. This is also found around Cairns, Daintree, and on the mid-east coast of Cape York, in hot, humid swamps. It's been found high in the canopy of mangroves, in the full sun, and it can also grow on palms. This species, um, I, don't, I don't believe any photographs exist. If you look at uh, Google Earth and look at the Daintree River, almost all of the area south of the river was um, completely cleared for sugarcane and cattle, and we lost a native banana species that was living only there. Its name from um, Mauza in Arabic means banana, and the name of an author. Its order is from the gingers. Now the Daintree River banana was robust and it was about six metres tall with a green stem and colourless sap. And it's, own, it's known only from a type specimen that was collected along the Daintree River before that area was completely decimated. Now um, the Mossman fairy orchid I could not find a single image of. Its name means Oberonia as in the fairy king from A Midsummer Night's Dream by Shakespeare. And then coming to a point. Now it's one of 30 plants that the Australian government has prioritised resource allocation for. And they're looking at banking tissue cultures and it was thought it was extinct until 2015 because no one had seen it in 50 years. Now, and, and people had been looking for it. It was rediscovered in the southern edge of the Daintree National Park at the Mossman Gorge. Now this image here is not Oberonia attenuata, this is Titania. I drew this on a Wacom uh, from a specimen, from an actual photograph in the Daintree uh, with a little bit of artistic license, but this is more or less how splendid the Oberonias can be. Now uh, the tonsil orchid, Redagnzinia to me is a South African name and it's named after Bruce Gray, hence Grey Eye. Now it's found only in the Daintree, Daintree National Park and it was only collected by Bruce Gray in 1983 but its site was destroyed when they were creating, uh, well this is around the time of the Bielke Peterson government. Now it hasn't been seen since and as far as I know it's it's, uh, it may be extinct. I'm, I'm not sure what happened with the government classifications on this species. Pixie caps, this is another extinct species, pointed flowers with a curved shape. So that might refer to the actual flower itself, or it could be the, the body over the flower, like the fornix in the human brain is curved. It was a small orchid, only about five centimetres high, with two to six flowers from a deep purple to a reddish brown. Now interestingly it had short, broad petals that were lance-shaped, and the labum which, labellum, which you can see in the image here, attracted insects as a landing platform. And it was only found on one site, east of Gelatin at the south end of the Daintree National Park and otherwise there were populations of it much further south. Chelo uh, lips, fragrant, and now I, I'm not sure if I translate this properly, um, potier should be um, poisonous, although it could refer to potency I suppose. Now the family 
is uh, the fragrance and this is found uh, from the Townsville to the Daintree and then again um, from Thursday Island upwards to PNG. The native moth orchid, its name in Latin is moth genus, the phaleon was a moth genus, looking, wonderful, subspecies, rosin tromine, which is obviously an author. This is found in northeastern Queensland from the Iron Range to Mount Speck at two to five hundred metres altitude. Now let's summarise. Let's look at Queensland and Daintree as a ratio of all endangered species in the state. Starting with flora, 96 species considered endangered found in Queensland, 25% in the Daintree. Of critically endangered, 33% found in the Daintree. And of extinct, 29% were living in the Daintree National Park. And fauna? 61 species of fauna considered endangered in Queensland, with 23% found in the Daintree and 32% of all critically endangered Queensland fauna found in the Daintree. Let's look at this on the bigger picture. This is Queensland, and the pink area here, this is the Daintree National Park, swelled a little to make it easier to see. With all of this ecological value in this incredibly small place. But how small is the Daintree National Park? It would fit into Queensland, 1,544 times. Now how did this happen? How did all of this diversity end up in one place? It's because, as, as it has been scientifically recognised, the Daintree is the oldest living rainforest in the world and has survived since the Earth was unrecognisable and configured very differently in the position of its continents. This was a presentation by Reforest Now. Here are the references that were used to produce this presentation. To contact us, to support us, or to give feedback, or for anything else, write to info at reforestnow.org.au. Feel free to share this video with your networks. And thanks for watching.